Greeting legacy family and friends. I pray that you're well. I pray that you are enjoying uh, the Lord's presence, the Lord's word, time in prayer, time with your family uh, in unique ways uh, under these unique circumstances. Uh, today I want to take a few moments with you uh, to think about that next day in this Holy Week. We talked on Sunday about the Lord's uh, entry into Jerusalem fulfilling all those prophecies, saying all those things by his actions that would become so abundantly clear not long after. And we talked on yesterday, on Monday, about how Jesus had entered into the temple after having cursed a fig tree that promised much fruit but produced nothing. And he flips the tables in the temple of those who sold and exchanged currency for all of the pilgrims that had come in to, to, to be about their, their religious duty during this high season of Passover, this, this very important time. And we know that Jesus left that Monday night back to Bethany, and here we are on Tuesday. And Jesus, for reasons that befuddle the reader upon first reading and for reasons that caused wonder in the in the religious leaders he makes his way back on tuesday to the temple after having caused so much ruckus knowing that in 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 the eyes of so many he was a marked man he set his face toward jerusalem to accomplish all that he had come to do but on his way on that same road he passed the same tree. The end of Mark chapter 11 tells us how his disciples noticed that the tree that Jesus had cursed, uh, that, that was not just symbolism. That was not just uh, some kind of, 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 of allegory. That was not Jesus just going about some kind of religious theater. That tree was dead. It was withered. Now let's just know that Jesus takes this fruitfulness thing very seriously. And what Jesus is saying by those actions is that the same fate awaits, awaits those who would take him lightly and what their mission was to be in this life. In particular, the religious leaders. It goes back to the center of operation for these religious leaders, the temple. And upon arriving there, he marches in again. The tables, I'm sure, were set up again. The coins were no longer on the floor Commerce was again, uh, the wheels of commerce were turning and profits were being made and pilgrims were being served and Jesus enters and the fact that he came stirred questions, questions that just had to be posed to Jesus and, and posed with a certain amount of venom, hoping, hoping that he would, would take a misstep, that he would somehow incriminate himself. And they come to him and they start with the most obvious question. By what authority do you do these things? And Jesus, before he answers them, says they must answer him. He says, well, let, let me ask you this first. Was the baptism of John from heaven or was that from man? And the religious leaders said if we answer that that baptism was in fact from God and this John was speaking the truth, if we, if we say that, they're going to say, then why aren't you following the Christ that he came to be the forerunner of? But if we say that it was, no, it, it was just a man, John, John was just another of a long line of false prophets, then the people will turn on us because the people really held John to be a true prophet. And the last thing they wanted to do was lose the crowds and the income that came with them. It's a sad, sad situation. I wish I could say it was totally foreign to us today. But those words still ring, and they ring true, and they ring painful for so many. Or at least they should. Jesus says, well, if you're not going to answer me, then I'm not going to answer you. And that's so weighty. Jesus is saying, listen, if you have no interest in truth, I won't give you truth. Or the truth is reserved for the honest. If you think that the truth is something that is to be manipulated, told halfway, sugar-coated, spun, 
I'm not going to give you more truth to abuse. And so he didn't answer them. Which should make us look inward. Which should make us say, what is my heart towards truth? Am I, am I truly one who seeks truth? Am I one whom Jesus would readily share more truth with, with more revelation of himself from the scripture? Would he open my eyes more and more and more because I am one who so desires truth that I might come to know him through it? They proceed to ask him a series of questions, hoping to, again, entrap him. And Jesus would have no part of it. But Jesus was not just there to be questioned. Jesus had some things to say. And he says them to them in the form of parables. And when we look at the harmony of, of the two accounts of, of, of Mark and, again, of, of Matthew, we see him uh, give uh, several, but, but, but two parables that we'll have time to at least briefly mention here today. And the, the first one he mentions is uh, a parable, uh, a story of, a deeply symbolic story of a landowner who had leased out his land to some tenants under the agreement that at the time of harvest, they would produce for him fruit. That was the whole idea, that they would take this that was his and produce for him fruit at the end of the transaction. And the time comes for the landowner to have his fruit. And so he sends messengers. See, but somewhere along the line, those who were merely tenants began to fancy themselves as the owners of the land. And they said, no, we're not going to give the best parts back to the one who, who let us come here and, and use and farm the land. And so they mistreated every messenger that he sent until finally the landowner says, I'll send my very son. They'll respect him. But instead of respecting him, they, they rejected him. And not only rejected him, but they murdered him. And... We as Christians, and particularly in the, in the context of this week, we, we, we see it. We, we see the symbolism of this parable. God is the landowner. The religious leaders, they're the tenants. Jesus is the son that he sends. Jesus was in the process of being rejected. But that's not where the parable ends. At the end of it, after his son is brutally rejected and murdered, it's made known that the landowner will come and bring his wrath down upon those tenants. Follows it with another parable according to Matthew. and He speaks of a wedding feast. He speaks of a wedding feast wherein invitations go out and those who were invited chose to do other things. They valued other things. They, they chose to reject the invitation of this great host and said, no, we'll, we'll have no part of your wedding. And so because they denied and delayed and, and, and simply rejected what he was offering to them, the parable goes on to say that the invitation went beyond them. It went down to, to the highways and the byways. It went to the offscoring of society. It went to the least savory of characters. And they are brought in and given the seats and given the place and given the proximity to the king and given a place at the table of feasting that would have been theirs. And we might say, wow, that's great poetic justice. That, that's a great story with a happy ending. Oh no, it's, that's not the half of the happiness, friends. You and I are those outliers who were invited in. It's so much more than a parable. That's my story and that's your story. If you've received Jesus and you've come to the, the, the beautiful understanding that I have no right to be his. I have no right to all that is mine in Christ, but it's by his grace. Pharisees understood that those who'd been rejected and those who would not take part in the festivities, the ultimate, grand, never-ending festivities, it was them. They were the tenants. They were the, the invitees who did not RSVP in the affirmative saying, we'd love to be there. But here we are. And it's all because of this Jesus and all because of what he's done. 
And while those religious leaders went through all of the motions of a Passover feast and missed the fact that there among them, standing among them, flipping their tables, just destroying their, their paradigm and their priorities, there was the perfect Passover lamb. There would need to be no other lamb. And there among them was also the one great high priest, the only one worthy to offer up the sacrifice. So there he is, the priest, the only worthy high priest, and the lamb, the only spotless precious lamb. Jesus is everything. Jesus does everything. Jesus is everything. All of salvation is by his grace, and we are to but receive it by faith, and even that faith is a gift from him. The hymn writer was, was right. Jesus, he paid it all, all to him I owe. I was standing in our church building uh, yesterday, and I think just knowing that there's not the regular weekly anticipation that all the saints are going to gather, it, it struck me. The emptiness of the building really, really struck me this week. Every other time that I walk through there, I pass by the sanctuary, and I think that, that's where the saints are going to gather. I, I know the church is not a building. The church is a people. But just knowing that the saints would not gather, I felt the particular emptiness of that structure, and I thought, Lord, you felt a lot of emptiness in the temple when you walked in there and none of the fruit that you were looking for was found. There was a lot of activity, there was a lot of commotion, but none of the fruit that you were looking for. And I said, Lord, let us never be such a people. Thank you for the stillness that has come amidst all of these difficult times that we're living in. And let us reevaluate all of the commotion and the activity and the busyness of what we call our, our, our Christian life, our religious activity. And let us be striving not to be just busy, just involved. But let us be fruitful in all the ways that please the Lord the most. He's worthy. I pray that God meets you every time you bend your knees in prayer. I pray that God illumine you every time you open his holy writ this week and always. I miss you desperately. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Call for any reason. Let's continue to network and reach out and care for one another. And, and just know, just know God is at work and he's doing great things for his glory and our eternal good. Lord bless you and keep you.